So thank you very much for coming and welcome to the new butterfly season. Me, well, I'm the Transact co Coordinator for uh, Yorkshire. Uh, I've been doing it now for four years. And um, it's great to uh, meet all you Transact walkers. Uh, our very first meeting we did with Yorkshire Wildlife Trust and Philip Welpdale, who some of you will, I'm sure will remember his extremely good at his job and started so many transects in, in Yorkshire. But I'm very pleased to say tonight I'm joined by the, a, quite a big team from Yorkshire Wildlife. So I'm going to hand over now to Sharn to do the introductions on their side. Thank you very much, Nick. So hi everyone, my name is Sean McMillan and I am the head of the Nature Recovery Directorate at the Yorkshire Wildlife Trust. Um, we were a little bit quiet uh, after Phil Welpdale left the Trust, um, but we now have set up a new directorate, which is the Nature Recovery Directorate. And as um, Nick said, I'm supported tonight by um, some members of my team. Um, we took over the coordination last year and I'm supported by Beth Clarkson, who is our data and evidence officer, and she's on the call. Um, and also by Kerry Metcalf, who is our new volunteer coordinator. Um, Kerry's uh, waving away there, and I think she might also be sharing a little bit of information about her sites uh, a little bit later on. Um, we're really pleased to be working again with um, Butterfly Conservation and with Nick. Um, it's really important for us to be collecting data. Um, it's, it's super important for helping to inform our management on our reserves, but also really important to be collecting that data across Yorkshire so that we can understand what's happening with our butterfly populations, how we can best um, intervene and manage for them and have the biggest impact for nature's recovery across Yorkshire. So thank you very much, Nick, for everything that you're doing. And we're really pleased to be working with you. Thank, thanks, Sean. This is the uh, program for the night. So, um... We're going to now look at it's uh, how how and why we gather evidence. Uh, answer a few of your queries on, on that, uh, and what we do with that evidence, which is really important, as Sharma was just saying. Uh, then we're going to move on to the review of twenty twenty three. What was the, what was the effect of the very hot summer of twenty twenty two? You remember how hot it was, burning hot. Uh, how it's affected the, the trends in combination with a very cool, wet summer. And from most per people's perspective, it was a very poor uh, summer for butterflies. But what was it actually like out there, out in the countryside? Uh, and I'm also following on from last year, we do, took a, a deep dive into six species and went back 20, 30 years. We're going to do the same again this year. Um, after that, just after eight o'clock, we're going to look at our new transect sites and new walkers. And then it's over to you, uh, your contributions on issues affecting your sites, open to questions. So why do we count butterflies? Uh, well, it's been, a, in my opinion, it's been a bit in the headlines just recently. Um, there's really been some chaos out there. Um, this is actually a picture from Holland of the, the farmers are all protesting uh, about the Europe-wide legislation, which is aiming to reduce farming subsidy in favour of supporting nature and by also cutting emissions of like nitrogen as well as uh, obviously CO2. Now, in, in, in Europe, this is going to be evidenced not only by bird surveys, but also by butterfly indices. So um, I thought of the wartime uh, adage, uh, keep calm um, and carry on counting butterflies to these poor beleaguered farmers after the evidence that uh, Derby University found about big butterfly count last year that reduces anxiety for up to seven weeks after taking part. And I guess, I guess many of us this evening we know all about that because we 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 know the benefits that we have personally, and we enjoy doing what we do. Uh, across the forty thousand members of butterfly conservation, it's surprising there are ten thousand, nearly ten thousand 
transect walkers in the country, which I found quite a startling number and just shows that people get a lot of mental uh, benefit from it. I certainly enjoy my my three transects. I enjoy them immensely. One to see the changing seasons, but also just a deep dive into nature. You become part of that world when you're when you're concentrating on counting. It's a very very special uh, feeling that you get, and very satisfying when you come home. So I absolutely agree with that uh, the sentiment of the wartime sentiment, and recommend to our farmers that get out there, start counting butterflies. And stay calm. So what do we want to know from all this counting? Well, there's, there's two things. Uh, if you want to assess how a species is doing, we need to, We there are two things involved. So there's occurrence, which is relatively easy to measure, which is you just go out, you see two, a brimstone, and you come back in, you put it on iRecord, it's recorded there. Um, but abundance is a very different thing. To measure abundance, we have to do, do it with a very systematic approach, which you're all, probably all familiar with, apart from the new people here tonight, of, of which I know there's quite a few. Measuring abundance, we have to do it regularly because butterflies only fly at certain times of the year. So it's a weekly thing that we have to do. Uh, and we have to do it in a very systematic way. So it's called the Pollard Walk. You'll all be familiar with it, but I'll repeat it anyway. So you're walking in a box. It's like a five meter square in front of us, two and a half meters either side. We walk it when the temperature is high enough for flight, which is above 14 degrees centigrade. And most importantly, it has to be sunny. Now, there are a few uh, things that, that are important in addition to make our walk valid. So 14 degrees centigrade, it has to be at least 70% sun. And that confuses quite a few people. What that means is 70% of the time, the sun is casting a shadow. There are some exceptions. So for example, if you're working on Ingleborough, one of the high, high, um, high uh, transects, uh, you, won't, you won't get 14 degrees. So you can walk if it's sunny at temperatures down to 12 degrees centigrade, but it is very much the exception. So for most of us, it's 14. And the, a big question that new walkers always have is, well, what, how do you define sunny? Well, it's very easy. Use your hand, stick it out. If there's a shadow on the ground and you can count your fingers, it's sunny, full stop, black and white. If you remember that, it's great. Well, so what's 70% then? Well, that means that for 70% of the time, it's sunny. And various people have various techniques of how they calculate that. The most popular one is the chocolate bar method. So you divide each section of your transect up into tenths and you eat a, cho a piece of chocolate every, every uh, one that you walk that's it's sunny in. Obviously with 10 sections, how many pieces of chocolate you've eaten times 10 equals the percentage sun. Um, some fi people find that an easy way to remember how you calculate that. Every section that you walk, you record the amount of sun. That is equally important. So we're walking in this imaginary strip and we're counting every butterfly that enters that square. But you've got to be very aware that they can double back on you. The one that flew back past you a minute ago came back and there's a very strong element of uh, um, double counting if you're not very careful. First rule is keep up your speed. So the transect speed is about a slow walk. Doesn't have to be absolutely precise, 
but it does need to be steady. If you're concerned about sun and the sun has been in for more than say four, four or five minutes, you can stop, wait for the sun to come back out and carry on. I've done that on in April, that's possible to do. And then you take the time out at the end of the transect. It's, but generally try not to avoid situ situations like that. To avoid duplication, um, try and keep an eye of that one that's just flown past you. Remember, you're not counting anything that's, that goes behind, which is behind you. You're only counting what's in front of you and either side, two and a half meters either side. So it's about three or four strides either side. Uh, once you get the hang of it, it's dead easy, but watch out for the small ones. The skippers are devils because they're so quick and so small. They whiz past you, you don't see them. I would say looking at everybody's results, a number of people miss the skippers quite regularly. Um, everybody's pointed out on the chat about the difficulty with whites. How the heck can you uh, identify all the whites in flight? Well, the simple rule, you can't recognize all the whites in flight. You have to do a guess. So count everything, but you must apply an intelligent guess to those that you can't be quite sure about. And if I, we get the chance to discuss the whites in a bit more detail, I'll give you a few tips. But in essence, um, if you follow two or three whites that whiz past you with your eye, watch them settle or confirm your the identity, you work out a percentage in your head. So I'm seeing around 50% small whites and 25% large whites, 25% green vein whites might be a common number. So if one whizzes past me, uh, is there's a 50% chance it would be a small white, 25%. So what I do is just put down what I think would be in the percentage terms, what would be the next one in that sequence, if you see what I mean. So I kind of apportion it in my mind. You, we're not expecting you to identify every white, etc. That's just impossible. Uh, but for most other species, I think it is, it is possible to identify. Um, and you get used to where you see, see different species on your transect. After you know a few weeks, you know the green green vein whites live near the dike. The small whites are always in the open. The green vein whites are always in the shade, and there's lots of little tricks you can you can do. So coming on to the data, so where does this data all come from? Well, that dirty great map you see there is the whole of, U of England, showing in blue all the. Uh, full transects and in red or the uh, wider countryside uh, transects. Now, we're talking mostly about the uh, full transects, the UK BMS transects tonight, but I should mention the wider countryside uh, because we have quite a shortage of them in, in, in Yorkshire, simply because it's so huge. Um, we've only ever been issued with 65 uh, squares. So basically, it's a square on a map that's chosen randomly. Um, and uh, a good many of them are done by um, BTO. They do a good percentage of them. Um, and we do the rest. Basically, we share the square database. And basically, you have to walk your square on a fixed route again twice per year. So it's a lot less onerous and more flexible than the every week transect. The other thing to mention about the UK BMS transects is the time of day. So particularly during the beginning part of the season, we're not allowed to start till quarter 11. So 10.45 and finish before 3.45 in the afternoon. In the peak of summer, in other words, June and July and August, you can bend that rule. Uh, and obviously, during the hot summer of 22, we had to bend that rule because it was too hot after 11 o'clock to even think about going outside. So um, I would say a lot of species tend to prefer the morning than, than the afternoon and will actually go to go to roost in the hottest part of the day. 
So if it's going to be hot weather, I would try and do it earlier in the day if you can. So this data that we collect um, goes into lots of documents which are quite influential. Probably the most influential is the UK Biodiversity Indicators, uh, which is shown here on the left, which is the government DEFRA scheme, which goes into the 25-year plan. Now, the 25-year plan, um, it was an idea developed by Professor Lawton in the Lawton Report, was to leave the next generation with nature in a better state than how we found it. It's a hell of a challenge. I don't think it's going brilliantly well. Um, butterflies, I think the verdict out on butterflies, there's a lot of other species uh, which are suffering worse. Uh, the next document is, and you might have seen this, is the state of the UK butterflies. It's a very comprehensive, but very, very technical, dry, I would say, boring document, sorry. Um, but it has one plus, which I'll point out to you, and it's relevant to, for tonight, is it classifies the different nations of the UK for the first time this last year. So it splits off Northern Ireland, Wales, Scotland, after devolution, they have their own uh, analysis. And the differences are absolutely enormous when it comes to our butterflies. And we're going to talk about that some more. But in essence, butterflies might be declining in southern England, where all the transects are. But in Scotland, abundance is, is nearly doubled in the last few years. Now, the state of nature, um, Sharon will be very familiar. She probably contributed to that document. It's the Wildlife Trust document, uh, which took a lot of our data and moth data to do a, a overview of, 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 uh, um, of the whole of nature, much more uh, inclusive document than the UK biodiversity, which only uses birds, dragonflies, uh, butterflies, I think reptiles as well, things that are systematically monitored. So I'm sorry about the red squiggles. They've come and I can't get rid of them. <laughs> um, so I apologize for that. Um, this is our results for this year. Back in 2019, we had uh, 50 UK BMS transects. If you go a bit back a bit further, 2005, we only had 10. Last year, I'm pleased to say, and that's grown to 106 now, we had 106 transects walk this year, uh, of which 25 were new, uh, or restarts. We get quite a few restarts of our old ones, which were encouraging because there can be a lot of data. Uh, and the data gets more valuable the longer that data set runs. Only 13 uh, WCBS squares were walked, one new, one lost. I'm very pleased to say, there's 240 of you um, volunteers, of which six of, 60 of whom were new. You contributed 1,700 transect walks. You covered 4,000 kilometers or 3,000 hours of work. That is no mean achievement. If you look at what we've done since the beginning, back in two, from the 1990s, we've walked around the planet once uh, and there's something like a thousand years, transect years of data just in Yorkshire. And we're going to, we are going to risk it. We're going to look at some of that data later on. We're also doing a better job. The little graph on the side there is our regularity. It's divided into three. So the green is the 20 walks, which is our target. We want to, of the 26 weeks, because our, our year runs from the first, first of April to the, last, to the end of uh, uh, September. Uh, and there's 26 weeks in that period. I remember the butterfly week this year starts on a Monday. So it's Monday while Sunday. Um, if we walk 20 weeks, there's a very good likelihood we get a full set of indices of all the species on your site. What we're really trying to do is, particularly the month of July is a critical month. 
so many species are flying in July. If we miss a week, it's no, no particular big problem. If we lose two weeks in July, that is a big chunk out of the numbers and the species. So my advice is to make your work count. Try and ensure you cover July, even if you have to ask for some help. Try and do it. If you do 15 walks, there's a good likelihood we'll get most of the indices. And this year, out of the 106, we've got 75 sites that produce a good set of annual indices. That's absolutely brilliant. Uh, we're also, last year, I also introduced the idea that, we're, that our target now, we've got a good number of transects, is to get seven sites from every landscape in Yorkshire. And I'll show you what that looks like in a minute. But most important, I want to say thank you to all of you. I know how hard it is to find the time to get out there in the right conditions I've just outlined and do your walk, particularly when you have that cold start to the April and that horrible east wind that just seemed to blow forever. And then July when it just seemed to rain and rain and rain. Or so many days when you wait till 10, you, you're waiting till 10.45, it's beautiful and sunny. What happens at 10.45? Yes, all that cloud bubbles up, uh, comes over the horizon, the sun goes out and it's then dark until it rains in the afternoon. I don't know how many times that happened last year. Uh, it's happening more and more with climate, climate warming. Uh, and we're gonna look a bit more at climate warming as, as we go through the evening. Okay, this is what I promised you. This is the um, how we've divided up the uh, uh, the county. So we're using the Natural England definitions for landscapes, and you can probably pick out some of them. So over here, you can see where my pointer is. I hope you can see it. Uh, is the Wolds? Then you've got the Holdness in here. You've got North York Moors with the tabular hills along the south edge of the Moors, Rydale, Vale of York, uh, the Humber Head. Uh, and very important, because so many butterflies live along it, is the Magnesium Limestone Ridge, which is this yellow thing that almost, it follows the A1. Basically, the A1s, the Romans knew what they're doing. They wanted dry feet. And so they built their road straight down the Limestone Ridge, um, um, hence, it's 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 it follows that line pretty much exactly, and there's so many sites along there where where the rivers burst through that ridge, is you'll find the concentration of butterfly sites, some real crackers there, there like Brockadale, um, and so many more uh, close to Pontefract. There's there's loads of beautiful um, butterfly sites. Then over here we have. The, the dales and the craven lime the, the lime uh, limestones here grassington ingleborough um which are some of the uh, uh best butterfly sites then down here we have the coal measures still a good measure of uh, of, of sites and the pennine fringe uh here and then the tops of the pennines here so the numbers correspond to the numbers over here in the table and the colors correspond to the habitats here. So if it's pale green, it's calcareous grasslands. Uh, if you go to the website, this is on the monitored sites page. It's the first page you come to. If you click any of these locations, it will take you to your transect. Um, so I think I made it a little bit easier to reach stuff. I hope you found it. Has, I'm, I'm hoping people had time to explore this uh, and go and have a look at our work. But I think we're the only county that has done extensive reports for e each of our sites. Um, for many people, and the reason I've done this is I always felt in the early years that our data just goes into a big black hole and never comes out the other end in anything intelligible. And I produce these reports really each year. 
um, for each site. It's a hell of a job, by the way. Um, it, it occupies about um, a month and a half of pretty solid work. But I think it's worth it because it gives you so much back. So here's Hornby Hill. Uh, you'll see the report at the top, how it suffered in last year's drought. And you can see it over here, the all species, there's a considerable drop off in in numbers. It's it's not unusual to see bumps and lumps. It was a particularly big dip this last year. Um, and the important species, of course, there is the Duke of Burgundy. It's a key site, one of the key sites in the UK, by the way, for Duke of Burgundy, a very important uh, location. Uh, and other relevant species, so things like the ringlet here, you can just, uh, in the drought, it just fell off the edge of a cliff, apparently, uh, down to very low numbers. Um, but that's uh, uh, another story, which we'll, we'll cover in a minute. Um, I hope you've seen this. So it shows each year, and for the last five years, uh, this is the 23, 2023 results, we compare it against the five-year average. And uh, along with what I do each, each year is compare each site with the overall Yorkshire figures. So as to give, give, give you some feedback on how it's doing against the other sites. Now this year, there's some, been some massive differences because of the weather conditions. Um, and you have to bear that in mind. If you're trying to guide Yorkshire wildlife managers, then you need to understand that it's, 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 there's a huge amount of variation year to year in butterfly numbers, which have got nothing to do with the site. It's to do with the weather and other factors. And my job is to try and kind of split that out and try and give some guidance as to what's happening. Hence these graphs, which I think are great for picking out, picking out trends on sites. So that's the reason I do it. I don't think there's any other county that, that does it. Um, so we're fairly unique. And I do hope it's it's useful. Um, There's another, um, it's a mind boggling and I apologize immediately. It's a bit mind boggling chart. It's the very last table I'm gonna show you tonight. You'd be very pleased to say, cause I'm known for uh, massacring figures. Um, just concentrate on the orange squares. So on one side, you've got the species. Along the top, you've got sites. Uh, this I did fairly early in the, in, in, in the autumn. So it's not got all the sites on it. And there would be too many to show in, in one sheet. But what's interesting is the orange is the, is the, is the highest count amongst all the different sites. And what you see, and this is important because this is not a com this is not competitive. I'm not trying to say this site's better than that. That's irrelevant. What's important is we get a good spread across where where across all different sites. So each site, and this is, always amazes me, almost every site is either top or second or third in one species. Just have a look at it. Maybe you can pick out your own site. I guess the one that stands out probably is the forest of flowers and its massive count of uh, particularly uh, uh, the browns. It's a, it's a, it's a, 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 um, a biodiversity project uh, where the land has been inverted and then sown with wildflowers. It is a forest of flowers. It's been planted with trees as well. Um, and it manages to score some tops in, quite a few of the grassland species, um, but it's not competitive. Don't think for one second it's anything about competition, but it does show the quality, it, the, some of the quality, the good qualities of some of our sites. And the kind of ones I would pick out are places like uh, Brockadale, where I think there's one, two, three, four, five, it's got six six in the top top two or top three. Um, Bishop Wood, which happens to be mine, my my transect, um, we managed to be uh, the highest for things like uh, silver wash fertility. fertility. Um, another top one would be Whitcliffe uh, 
over in uh, in Richmond, which is Catherine's at a high altitude uh, transect. Uh, went hillside, um, which is next door to Brockadale, scores very highly in, in lots of species. But it does give you a flavor where where things occur. Because one of the criticism that's leveled against this is, it's all right doing all these measurements on nature reserves. It's got not it's not connected to to reality. Well, I would disagree with that. And this chart, I think, uh, confirms that there's so much variation in all the different sites, providing you do enough uh, enough sites and average everything, you do get a good impression. Plus, we have the wider countryside uh, scheme to help us uh, understand that. 2023, nearly our best year ever. I think half of you will disagree with that immediately because for half of you, it was not a terribly good year. However, some of the good bits, and there's some really good sites, had an amazing year. I, must, I live here in the Vale of York on a, on a farm. I get to walk it every morning, and I've never seen the numbers that I saw last year, just the regular species, the ringlets, the meadow browns, the small, small skippers. I've never seen so many small skippers for years. Uh, Let's just take a little trip back in time before we before we dive into that and just look back at climate change um, and the things that are happening out there. I've taken this back all the way back to 1884. And the simple reason was, uh, and it's, it's a cataclysmic event uh, back in, by Krakatoa in 1883. We had four or five really dark years after that it like the loss of the dinosaurs after the uh, great asteroid uh, it was a very grim time and we lost a huge number of species from new yorkshire but then it bounced back and then through the following decades it went up and down and you see at the bottom there i've marked warm spells cool spells and this is you can go back hundreds of years, thousands of years, there's nothing new about rapid change in temperature and the kind of things we've seen in recent times. Um, we have to be honest, there's been 40 ice ages uh, at the present time. We're in the interglacial period, 15,000 years, 10,000 years into, into it. Um, this is the warm spell of a 50,000 year cycle. So most of the time, this, this island of ours is a lump of ice with no butterflies. And I think you've got to remember that. They come, they go, and the stories that I'm going to tell are basically that. So on this chart, the red line is the av kind of um, like the COVID graphs we used to see on the TV. This is the, the, the moving average just to get a better feel of what's been happening to temperature. When do we actually, we see these rises and then falls and the 1930s, 1940s, there was a warm spell. Quite a, We lost a lot of species back in, in the turn of the centuries. They tended to come back to some, escape, some extent in the 30s and 40s. Uh, particularly these warm years were often associated with species returning to Yorkshire. Um, now, remembering that Yorkshire is very special because it's a northern northern um, line between northern species and southern species. And that line has moved from the just below the south of the county all the way through the county over the course of uh, the last 30 or 40 years. And we're going to see quite a lot of that tonight. So let's pick out a few years. Uh, when species returned. And over here, you see a chart here with when species actually returned. 1911, small copper. And when I say return, uh, I mean when there, there's been a significant rise in abundance somewhere near the Vale of York. So I'm using Vale of York because York is a big place. Yorkshire is a big place. So I'm using the, the Vale of York as, as, as the place. Um, you notice that peacock 
small heath return in that big peak, 32, 34. Uh, large skipper, 47. Uh, common blue, then uh, back in 1970. Then things got really interesting because we hit a minimum here. And there is a line just above 18 degrees where everything seems to take off. But 18.4 degrees centigrade, species began to return in quick succession. So you'll see the names here. I'm not going to read them all out. It take me too long. But you can see there the number of species that we can see in and around York has almost doubled over that period from 1963 till today. So if you've been in York in, in the 70s, you wouldn't have seen orange tip, you wouldn't have seen marble white, you wouldn't have seen brimstone, uh, you wouldn't have seen a hair streak. Uh, the list is long. So we've come a long way. Um, and roughly species are arriving in, York, in Yorkshire one every four years, which is a difficult figure to get your head around. The latest one, and we could argue about it, 2022, the Purple Emperor arrived in Sheffield. Just one, but it was there. That's the important bit. It's not established. I don't think it's breeding. None were seen last year. What will be the next one? Well, there's a mighty queue uh, forming just across the channel. There must be at least a dozen species waiting. And this last year, uh, we do have a new UK spe species breeding. Uh, the American uh, Painted Lady arrived in the Isles of Scilly and there's bred now for two years on the Isles of Scilly. So just to show you, this is very, very dynamic. So how was 2023? Back down to Earth. Autumns are important because that's when a lot of things go into hibernation. And caterpillars, and a lot of our species hibernate as caterpillars, are very susceptible to fungi in particular. If they don't go cleanly into diapause, hibernate, then they can get stressed and they can die. Uh, so even though it's warm and there's a heavy rainfall uh, in the autumn, the switch to winter was very quick. In the beginning of December, it froze and it was a very quick transition. I think that's important. The same happened last year. And I think that may be responsible for some of the good results that we see this year. So Yorkshire's winter, well, it was significantly warmer, two degrees, that's ridiculously warm. Um, February was exceptional. Uh, spring was somewhat average, although it was somewhat domin uh, dominated by those cold easterly winds I mentioned. Uh, April was difficult because of that coldness. Uh, I know a lot of us failed to do any transects. I know, I think I managed two or three on my transects. But May it changed. It was warmer than average and it was dry. But then things got really interesting. So June was exceptional. And I think this is the crucial month of the year. So many, in the beginning of June, so many of our caterpillars are in their final instar. If that goes quickly, because they're at their most vulnerable, because they're big, they're juicy, and the birds are feeding their young. So it's a quick and easy big meal for a blue tit, for example, to find a nice big fat caterpillar. If you can get through that quickly, your chances of survival are so much better. Remember all those hundreds of eggs that got laid, because it was beautiful weather last year. If those eggs survived, then we only need a few percent shift in survival to really cause a big change in numbers this year. So as I say, I think June clinched the year numbers wise. Because once July ar has arrived, you can see it here. Uh, it was cold. It was wet. It was thoroughly awful. I think some of us missed a number of transects down a half degree. August was somewhat average. It had good and bad bits mixed in. September was exceptionally warm. And of course, we know what's happened this year. We've had it exceptionally warm uh, into, into uh, autumn. It's been a bit seesaw. We had a cold, cold, cold uh, uh, beginning to December. 
uh, but then it's been largely very warm, very, very wet. Um, but that often happens after a really dry period uh, that we had in 2022. So that's the weather. The results, this is the bit that we're, we're, we're interested in. What this shows is it's a species along the bottom and the percentage change, the winners and the losers. So losers on the right, the red, the blue is the winners. And you can see equal number, the important bits are equal numbers of winners and losers. Overall, the numbers were up 9%. And it's very close to our all time record, which was 2014, which was also a year after a hot, sunny 2013, which is the last really good year. It just managed to beat 2018. The winners are largely the climate change winners. Brimstone, we covered that last last year in great, great detail. Holly Blue, the Red Admiral. Well, Red Admiral had an exceptional year. It was their best year on record. Same for Brimstone, same for Holly Blue, same for Marble White, the best year on record. Speckled Wood, also the best year on record. Uh, it, quite exceptional. Um, and they're all winners in the climate climate change. The losers, there's a few of them, are those that seem to suffer in drought and heat. And there we're largely talking about uh, those on thin soils uh, lost quite a lot of abundance. But the ones to pick out, peacock, tortoiseshell, dark green fertility, they really just couldn't cope with the with the conditions. And for the second year running, small tortoiseshell almost failed to have a second generation. Normally it will have a first generation and they'll lay eggs in the next three or four weeks, it'll lay eggs, those will hatch in, in June, then there'll be another generation. Because of the heat in June uh, and the very poor nettle quality, because nettle just, just stopped growing in the heat. Nettle is, is, is a soft, succulent, water-loving, um, damp-loving species. And they just stopped growing, went blue and horrible. And the, the result is that those um, insects emerge, but they're not sexually, uh, they're not able to reproduce. They don't mature. They only have one thing they can do, and that is to hibernate. So the reason we saw so few later in the year is they hatched and they hibernated almost immediately. And the same with the peacocks, they hatched and hibernated very, very quickly. Um, it's noticeable now in the south of England that the, the peacock is having a double brood. So they'll, they'll emerge in early July and actually attempt to suck the second brood. In Yorkshire, we've not ever seen that, unless you tell me different, but I've never seen any double brooding. Uh, on the continent, it's normal. Um, and I think that's an adaption to climate change. More species are going double broods that if they can. Uh, whether it's a genetic alteration, it could be that it, genetics is involved, involved in, in double, moving to double broods. So that shows you the, um, the overall picture. Um, but you notice things like uh, northern brown argus, because it always lives on very dry sites, suffers small heath um, uh, on sandy uh, or upland sites. It suffered uh, ringlet, very sensitive, uh, own, only likes uh, damp conditions, suffered a lot. Uh, green vein white, a damp lover, suffered a lot. Uh, others, a lot of species were in between. Some species did rather well after the, the hot, dry conditions. And on some sites, small skipper and small copper and uh, common blue did exceptionally well. But not every site. It's quite a mixed bag. If we now, just as a contrast, turn those percentages into numbers, it actually shows um, a quite more dramatic picture that all the pluses are dominated by two species, Meadow Brown and the Gatekeeper. Both of them had record years. 
And the negatives, again, three species, ringlet, peacock, tortoiseshell, that we've already talked about. So this is numbers rather than percents. So the more common the species, obviously the bigger effect they have on this. You might be interested in this, and this is the effect on sites. So there's a very large difference, as I mentioned, between sites, uh, particularly from the drought of 2022. So that you, you probably remember that plants shriveled. There would be very few places that eggs probably got desiccated in those conditions, um, and it had an effect on things. The worst affected Hornby Hill, anybody who's familiar with that, it's a very, very steep, very steep, because it is so incredibly steep. Uh, I'm not surprised it suffered the most. Pexton Bank, another steep chalk uh, bank. Uh, Three House Wood Meadow is it's a sandy site, uh, unusually, but sandy sites were badly affected by the drought too. At the other end of the scale, we can look at wet grasslands with lots of hedges. Uh, they had a really great time. Priory Fields is a grassland and hedgerow site. Dunrick Gate is purely uh, hedgerows. Uh, Round Edge Shadwell is agricultural fields and hedgerows. Grasswood is woods. Sun Lane is a mixture. Uh, going down the list, Ascombe Bog is a woodland. Bishop Wood, my site, is mostly woodland. Uh, Kipling Coast, but it is a flat site, not so much on a hill. Um, and so on. But you notice there's a lot more uh, uh, winners than there are losers. What would happen if I put all that data that we gathered since the 90s, all those thousand years of data, and I haven't collated it all, I hasten to add, but I have managed to collate a lot of it. And I showed you this last year. If we bunged it all onto a graph and plotted it against summer the summer temperature what would it look like so follow the blue line to begin with so that's temperature and the blue straight line is the trend in the temperature and that shows you the effects of the warming climate so mean summer temperatures have risen 0.7 um, and the four hottest mays june and julys have been since 2017 and that rate of warming seems to be increasing over that period the abundance is increased by nearly a third um, but just follow where the green line is so the green line is your abundance of insects and just see how closely that green line mirrors temperature it's quite amazing but sometimes and you have a look here at 2013 was a warm year but 2014 is when we've got the big increase in abundance 2018 was the big year for for sunshine but it was 2019 when we got the big surge in abundance and 2022 was the hot year but 2023 was when we saw the increase in abundance so it appears to be all those eggs and young young that are laid the year before you don't see that big plus until the, the following year so that's i think the other big reason that we see the results this last year it's the cumulative effect of a warm year it's also those warm years we saw earlier, uh, those warm years also result in species spreading. And last year I talked a lot about the spread of different species. Uh, last year was, uh, was 2022 was a dispersal year. Um, and 2023 was an abundance year with a bit of drought. Also during this period, rainfall is increasing. Because that's the other factor in in, uh, in in climate change. And some of it is good for our butterflies. Some of it is bad for our butterflies. Actually, the weather is getting more extreme. So the number of rainy days is actually not increasing by the same amount as moisture. Remember, I'm just looking here from at the summer. So this is June, July, and August. In other words, when butterflies are at their most active. 
it's not a whole year. Sunshine hours, as you can see, the red line follows almost exactly the temperature. Um, yeah, so you can see here this year, there's 2014, our, our best year, uh, measured year in, in, near, in, in recent times. We were just a whisker. I think it was three or four butterflies away from of, of reaching 2014. I promise you just a quick, quick rundown of another six varieties. So hang on to your seats again, because uh, I'm going to make this very quick. There's no tables. It's all graphs. Um, orange tip. There's some startling big numbers in, in these, these, these charts, plus and minus. But orange tip is certainly one that's doubled in abund abundance in the last 30 years. And you see the graph here. It dips and it rises, as you can see. In recent times, that that rise and this is the the straight line is the 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 if you it plot a line through that point, that's that's trend line. The orange line is that moving average, which actually is more useful than that that line, because you can see what's happening in the in the in the recent term. But you can see that line is getting quite steep. So the rate of change is increasing, as you can see here, 64% in 20 years, 115 in the last 10. And also here, which we introduced last year, is the occupancy. Remember I mentioned about abundance and, and occupancy. This is actually the percentage of all the squares that were visited, uh, monads that were visited uh, in the year. This is the percentage that contained that species. It kind of gets rid of a lot of errors that you get with casual records, which are okay, but not terribly useful for doing stuff with, because it's not gathered in a scientific way. It's just somebody saw a in a certain place. This is our best, best guess um, of what's happening in terms of, of, it tends to follow the abundance, but is a different measure. It's actually the percentage of, uh, you can imagine is the, the percentage of, of land area occupied by that species. It's probably a, much bigger than that, but at least it's a consistent way of measuring. And you can see that as well as the abundance rising, that's also rising, uh, not by the same amount, it's a bit, bit slower, but it is rising. It's a big beneficiary of climate change. The warm, wet springs in particular, it loves. So you might remember uh, 2018 was a warm spring. 2019 was a very warm spring. And you get a massive peak like here because this is a spring butterfly. So maybe we should expect that. Gatekeeper. Well, yeah, the graph tells the story this year was unbelievable in terms of numbers. I've never seen so many. Um, there have been occasions in the past, back in the 90s, where there have been occasional really good years for them in, in South Yorkshire. Um, but this time it was much more all over Yorkshire. So, so we get a, a much bigger impression here of what's going on. Remember, this is an average of the whole of Yorkshire. Um, so it's up 120%. 400% in the last 10 years. That slope there is very high. And again, in terms of distribution, it's increasing. You see dips, and that's interesting because uh, it follows on, on both, both lines. You see this dip. But then we did have, um, you probably remember 2007 was a really wet year. Eight was a very wet year. Nine was a diabolical summer. Um, and it dipped and it didn't really pick. Summers didn't really pick back up until 2016. Did we see this rise? And you see this in almost all species that in those last four, eight years, uh, there's been a big change. Uh, so if you look at the last 10 years and use that, three, three out of four of our species 
are in a state of rising. Only one in four is decreasing. What happened this year? Uh, I guess it's related to last year um, and the hot, the hot June. It must have just landed perfect for them. Um, so a combination probably of, 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 of things. Comma. Mm. Remember, this is a new arrival in, in Yorkshire. You can actually see it here because I put a 30 year graph in. You can actually see it arriving and begin to build up. It then had a dip during those wet years that I've just mentioned. And then it began from about 2016, it began to slowly rise and then wallop. Well, this year, I haven't seen a year any, anything like it. Not, it wasn't everywhere, but you, almost universally, universally across the Vale of York, it had a wonderful time. Uh, again, with occupancy, it's still spreading, it's still increasing. Um, some dramatic numbers there. Small Heath. Now, this is one of the one of the losers. Uh, I think it's partly partly heat, partly nitrogen, partly drought. All things related to to it's a, it's a triple whammy of of negatives for the poor old Small Heath. Um, it doesn't like drought, and you can see these last two years here. It just it dips significantly. It dipped after the last warm spell, 2013, 2014. It dived to an even lower figure. And then after 20, 20, 2006, another really hot summer, it dived and it took some time for it to build back up afterwards. And that's also shown on the occupancy. That's on the way down. Um, the trend, it did... Uh, dip more strongly as the climate warmed. It did in those couple of cool summers, 2020, 2021, it actually stayed, uh, staged a, a comeback here. But unfortunately that was cut short by uh, 2022. So it seems to be really strongly influenced by um, heat drought, um, but it does need um, um, it hates nitrogen, um, but that's another story. Speckled Woods, another late arrival on the, on the scene and probably one of the most universal butterflies that we see now all the way through the years. I mean, you can see it from anywhere from the next few weeks all the way through till late October at any time of, in between um, because it's multi-brooded. But if, if if you go back, take the clock back to 2007, back here, it wasn't actually that very common. It was mostly woodlands, woodland edge. But then we have those really wet, sometimes warm uh, summers. And it came, I know in 2008, Eight, it came into the, into our garden. That's the first time I've ever seen it in our garden. But it's returned almost every year since. We have a hedgerow at the bottom of our garden. And I think we ought to, we think of it as a woodland insect. I don't think it is at all anymore. I think it's a hedgerow species, species and it's adapted to a new set of conditions. And that's the other thing about climate change. Grass growth is much lusher than I can ever remember in back to my childhood. Um, the growth of grasses is lusher. Uh, it's perfect for the uh, for 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 the speckled wood, uh, which loves uh, the, the grasses that grow in partial shade, um, particularly if it's damp. And I think that's what we're seeing. Um, it's a big beneficiary of, of climate change and the warmer, wetter summers. Um, these last two years, and you see them here, something crazy has happened. You see them here. Um, they've just gone completely crazy. 
And this brings me to another interesting point. There's been a huge decline of small tortoiseshell and peacock during these last two years. Um, but of course, when they go down, their parasites go down. Now, speckled wood, some people believe, is the way that the tortoiseshell parasite, the new one, Sturmia bella, it overwinters in speckled wood and then comes back onto the tortoiseshell the following spring. And the life cycles are pretty closely linked. So something very interesting going on there. I don't fully understand it. But if you look at um, comma, the same thing is happening. Comma has also gone crazy. Even though it lives in the same conditions as peacock and tortoiseshell feeding on nettles, why has the comma done so well and the comma and the the peacock tortoiseshell done so badly? Is it related to the parasites? Because the other thing was during 20 and 21, peacock and and tortoiseshells were having a boom time and comma went down. So is it to do with the parasite? I don't know. But I think it's uh, an interesting idea that all, all these, these, these species could be interacting. Common blue has got to be one of our worst stories um, in terms of numbers, how much has declined in the last 20 years, 80% decline. That mirrors some of the figures that uh, butterfly conservation uh, pump out um, of 80% decline. But always remember when you look at when you hear those figures from butterfly conservation, they always quote 1976 as their, as their starting point, because that's when transects began. But 1975-1976 were two of the best butterfly years on record. So obviously, if you compare against the best years on record, everything is going to be down. That doesn't mean it means it doesn't mean a lot. Um, but I guess it's good, good, um, uh, good for well. Everyone seems to like to catastrophize every um, event in nature these days. Um, you turn on the TV; it seems to be one long story of catastrophe catastrophization um, and I don't think so much of it is true and definitely not in Yorkshire um, when we are having new species arrive one every four years and we're seeing a 25 in percent increase in abundance I'm pretty hopeful that a, quite a lot of that will continue although I am concerned for our scarce species and even some of our common species, like the common blue and the small heath. Um, what's going to happen on, a res on our reserves? What can we do to help these insects? And I think for the common blue in particular, it's sensitive to nit nitrogen. When nitrogen's involved, you can't control where nitrogen comes out of the air. And that's what we're talking about. It's, it's agricultural waste. And the re coming back to that first picture of all the farmers protesting in their tractors, the Dutch government has put strict rules on how much nitrogen they can they can uh, lose from a farm. And nitrogen is having a big effect on butterflies in Europe, particularly the Low Countries, Germany, etc. And the reason is we all know it that grasses quickly overwhelm um, uh, flowering small flowering herbs like bird's foot trefoil. Um, I know Yorkshire wildlife go to great lengths with their grazing regimes to try and minimize the effects, but you can't stop nitrogen coming out of the air. The only way to stop it is at source, and that is the farmers. And farmers, we've got to win, we've got to win over the, the farmers to, to understand what real sustainability means. I think that's the key one. Um, we have the new um, Sustainable Farming Initiative came in in October of last year 
that's what brought the tractors out onto the streets uh, on Wales and elsewhere, uh, because it does strongly affect the the the, the upland farmers in particular. Um, they're in a in, in a very difficult in between stage where you're taking away subsidy, which in in the past has really been almost the same as farm profits. So the subsidies that we gave them just for owning the land have been almost the same as their profits. And we need them to adapt to a new reality. And that's going to be long and painful because it's their livelihood. And I have great sympathy for the farmers. I've been a farmer myself for 30 years. So I think I can I can speak a little bit for them. So um, my very last point before I hand back to uh, hand back is this is our new um, uh, um, thing that's coming along. You'll be getting a mail very shortly to join uh, Assemble. So this is a new volunteer hub. Uh, comes as a phone app or on your computer. Um, it looks like it could be useful. Uh, a lot of resistance from the older folks. Uh, do we need another app on our toy phones? Because uh, I'm an old, old um, stick in the wood. And um, I think it could be useful. But when you get the mail, there's a link to onboard. I would advise all of you to press that and at least get on board because what it will do is it will ensure that the uh, insurance cover covers you. You will not be insured unless you press that button. So I do it for that reason, if no other reason. I must admit, I'm still learning about it. I'm quite impressed because BC are trying really hard to uh, doing what we're doing this evening is actually involve you more and give you more back. A long late may that continue. So I'm going to hand back to my colleagues in Yorkshire Wildlife. And uh, are you there? Hi, thanks, Jeff. Thank you very much, Nick. That was some really interesting so much information you've been extremely busy collating all of that paper. <laughs> <laughs> um were you hoping at this point to um we're going to do our, our do yeah we're going to do our, our new sites so it's going to hand back to you at yorkshire wildlife to yeah, do um, your new do your new sites uh, okay, that's fantastic. I think um, we might have Mary on the call, who is uh, one of the Yorkshire Wildlife Trust staff, and I think she might be sharing um, a few of her sites with us. Mary, are you there? Yes, I am. Wonderful. Hi, Mary. Hello. Yeah, so I'm Mary. I'm a reserve officer for Yorkshire Wildlife Trust, mainly based in the West, West region. Um, so I manage a couple of sites. Uh, the main one being Sturley, which is 225 acres of mainly grassland, um, so it's former arable farmland, and we're working to diversify the habitats um, in, and generally increase biodiversity on site. That's involving doing things like planting hedgerows, reseeding wildflower meadows, improving management of wood pasture areas, um, and looking at scrub and tree planting in some areas over the next few years. So, what I want to there was a level of data on transects prior. Uh, there was an old Sturley transect that had very scattery data from a few years ago, but it didn't look at the areas that I particularly wanted to look at, which is our reseeded meadow areas. So I split the site in two and we put together, last summer we put together two transects, Sturley East and West, um, that cover a range of different habitats. And we're looking at watching what the butterfly species do as the meadow goes from being pure grassland to a more diverse meadow. And it will also inform some of our management if we're finding particular species on, and over time as well, looking at different trends in species um, and if there's anything we can do to improve our management. Um, so the other site I've set up is Upper Park Wood. Um, so it's a mixture of a 
ancient woodland and more recently planted woodland. Um, it's got a few woodland glades and a few patches of meadows as well. Um, so both of these sites have been set up over the summer. So we've only got a very small amount of data for both of them. So this coming year is going to be the first year we're going to fully walk all of them. And yeah, it's been interesting seeing what we've got and what the diff what we'll have this year when we get a full year's worth of data. Um, yeah. So those are the sites we're putting up mainly, and it'll be really useful for that to inform us in what we do. Site, Yorkshire Wildlife site, which is. Hetchell Woods. I hope you can see that on your screen. I don't know if Martin yes, is. Can. Thank you. I don't know if Martin is here tonight. I'm afraid I can't see all, everybody's names, but you're very welcome, Martin, if you're there to butt in. Uh, this is a wonderful site. So it's just on the edge of the magnesium limestone ridge, which is over here. And this dips down to a stream in the bottom here. And um, this this area here is called uh, a Pomp Pompa Cali, which is a Roman settlement, and it's uh, actually Roman workings, uh, and it's pure sand. So it's literally uh, magnesium limestone, a cliff, and then down to sand, a sandy sandy floor. Um, the big big thing about it is it's got two large meadow areas, and this is fairly this is. Um, Bardsey, which is near Weatherby. So, and it's got excellent um, habitat for marble whites. And the last few years, it's also been an excellent habitat for migrating um, dark green fertilities, which have occupied in large part this new field which Yorkshire Wildlife have been creating. Now, there's been a lot of ash dieback in this woodland area, and there's a heck of a lot of coppicing and, and sorting out going on here at the moment. There's some lovely elms going up this this uh, uh, side here, which the commas, because the comma doesn't, doesn't always live on nettles. It loves elms just as much as it loves nettles. And there's some excellent uh, habitat there for a comma. Um, this year, it's been a bit of a disaster for the dark green fertility, as I've mentioned earlier, because of the, the weather conditions, and it hasn't been seen at this site. Uh, I'm very much hoping that uh, it has survived somewhere and will come back in future years. I think it will. Um, but an interesting site of mixture of calcareous grassland and typical mixed uh, woodland uh, a lot of it, which is freshly coppiced. So that's going to be interesting to follow what happens to the butterflies. The grass bit here, which is partly, mostly heather, um, doesn't seem to have a huge amount of insect present, apart from the obvious um, uh, browns. But in the past, it's had green hair streak. So that'll be interesting to see if they return. So that's Hatchel Wood. So on my list, going to away from Yorkshire Wildlife now, is um, I'm just going to find RHS Barlow Carr, who joined us this year. And I'm hoping, uh, Ruth, are you there? I am. Can you hear me? We can indeed. I just got to find uh, your site. So this is quite an interesting site, and I'll let I'll let uh, Ruth explain but the route we kind of designed together to cover such a, a wide range of habitats and perhaps i'd let ruth would you like to take over from me and just describe why you decided to do this the kind of things you thought about when we designed the route and how your how your walkers are getting on i can i think the route was probably designed before i joined um in but i think the idea was to include as many habitat types as possible um which obviously as we're um a, a garden we have woodland we have herbaceous borders we have we have bits of grassland and we have a meadow 
um, and there's adjoining bits between, which could be, you know, border, border type. Um, so that was the thinking of the route. Uh, we do see different types of butterflies in different areas of the garden quite consistently, actually. The whites around the more herbaceous types yeah. in the woodland, um, yeah. we see speckled woods, tortoiseshell. Yeah. In the more grassland areas, we see the gatekeepers, meadow browns and ringlets. We did see yeah. a lot of ringlets. Um, and the walkers are getting on very well, thank you. There's about four of us that do it regularly. And there's another lady joining this year from the scientific department. So she's going to join in. Um, the only problem was the weather, really. Yes, it was um, I Yeah, we missed, we did only miss one week, I think, in the end, didn't we? Which was presumably in July. It just rained all week. Um, but apart what from it, that, go on, what, Tommy. Imp what, it, what impressed me most uh, when I walked it with, with your team was how you managed to meld species rich grassland with birdsfoot trefoil and even amongst some of the um more uh formal gardens you've got patches of really good high quality grassland that you've obviously maintained for some time as grassland and that's absolutely wonderful to see that uh the rhs has really gotten into uh, wild as well as formal gardening. And I have to compliment you on some of the quality of of of, of those areas. It's quite oh, exceptional. Um, I will pass that on to the powers that be. Uh, um, but I know there's a bit behind the library. Yes. Um, yes. And, we, and then we, did, we did choose it specifically because the habitats were were very good quality. And to be honest, I didn't expect to ever see that, although people mm. told me there's some good areas, um, and particularly along this this bank side here. Yeah. Uh, there's some some really cracking areas, and even in mm. the formal bits, uh, we were seeing mm -hmm. uh, common blues quite easily when we when we did our walk together. Yeah. So the, I, the other good bit is as you go around where it says S four S five. Yes. That is that grassland. grassland. Yeah, that is you can always see something there. Yeah. Um, really good bit. And then on the or the edges of the woodland are good. At once you get into deep woodland, you don't tend to see yeah. quite so much. But the sort of right. sunny the sunny edges, um, or where there's a tree that's come down around where your cursor is now, and that that's a really good site. Yeah. As with mm. everything, most of the diversity happens at the edge. The edge of the mm -hmm. pond, the edge of the wood, the edge of the grass. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Thank you very much, Ruth. Yes. Thank you. Is 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 Ricky Bull with us this evening? Yes. Ah, Ricky. Nice to have you. I'm going to go to uh, your new new transect at, at Woolley because I think a lot of people will be amazed at what you found there. I certainly was. I was completely flabbergasted. Uh, can... Further down. There we go. Right. For those unfamiliar, uh, this the importance of this site is it's the best known small blue site. So small blue is a endangered species. Uh, it was an introduction, uh, but it has absolutely gone bananas in this area. And to the north here is the is the old colliery, and it's been landscaped and left to go wild. But there's an area of housing just here to the to the south, uh, which had been developed, and some of their site is going to be destroyed. So the builders has been very good and allowed us access and for Ricky to do this this survey and she the main area is what they call a, a sustainable drainage area basically where that where all the drainage water goes so it's very wet during the winter and then because it's sandy it's very dry during the summer Ricky would you like to just take over from me because I probably stole stolen all your thunder there but I thought I ought to explain 
Sorry about that, Ricky. Um, would you like no, to no take problem. over and tell us a bit more about the results? Well, ab absolutely seen? amazing. I started in that um, that area that's within from S1 to S7. I started yeah. only doing that because yeah. we were um, looking for the small blues. Yeah. And that started, I believe it was May we, we began that. Um, and all that wiggling up and down is trying to to cover the area where uh, that had been planted with um with the appropriate um um kidney vetch isn't kidney it vetch. yeah um so i i wanted to make sure because these are are such tiny butterflies and i hadn't had any experience with them so i wanted to make sure that i counted them all um and obviously i, I was very careful about not double counting so it began with that and the amounts I was getting, a hundred um, small blues at a time. Here we have the numbers. Yeah, there are, there are my numbers. You can see the, the first uh, in that one through seven is within that area. Yeah. Then we extended it so that I was actually recording outside up where nine and 10 and 11 were, specifically um, eight and uh, eight and nine, yeah. which another bank, but it is a much more exposed bank. The prevailing winds, when they come, come from the West. Mm. And part of the reason that that area is so good is that there's a dip down into that, um, into yeah. the drainage and Therefore, they they get a bit of um, shelter, really. Yeah. Small blue sea tree. Yeah, so, I mean, it's been, it has been wonderful. And in addition to that, at the same time I was getting within those areas so many blues, I was also getting lots and lots of orchids. So oh, right. it's just just a spectacular little area. Yeah. Okay, anything else you want me to? I mean, uh, you've got lots of other interesting things in there. It's a reasonably good colony of small heath, um, but probably most spectacular for me is the marble the marble whites. Yeah, and that was, you know, uh, the reason I kept extending what I was recording was because I was seeing other butterflies within that area and then without. Yeah. Um, other than the small blues. So it, it really is, um, yeah, it was lovely. It's an exciting, exciting place indeed. A very exciting place <laughs> and, and limited access. And I, I, whenever I have people that come by, I try to, uh, because it's all fenced in, so it's not open to the public. Um, but I try to engage all of the the residents so that eventually maybe maybe we can pass it to to someone who's local who mm. can get equally involved indeed uh, do you want to talk about your first year at walton while we while we've got you here yeah um okay so that's that's also uh, uh quite exciting uh walton if i can find it there it is so this is the other side of Wakefield. Yeah. Woolly, by the, the Woolly, by the way, is um, on the side of the M1. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's so, just east of the M1 is Woolly. Walton's important because there's been a transect there for many, many years, dating right back to the to the 90s, and we can actually go down and look 1995 it was started um so there's a long history but the problem with anything because this is an old mine walton colliery it's been flattened uh a lot of the the stuff has been piled into a great big heap which is this bit here oh there's been landscaped with lakes uh and there's another huge big pile over here which proves to be actually some of the most exciting area um, but I'll let, again, I'll let, uh, rather than steal Ricky's thunder, let her explain how you, how you designed it and what you've seen. 
Well, I designed it with you, Nick. Uh, um, originally, they I added another um, another part onto it later on. Um, the they have a very active volunteer um, basis, and also the um, the biodiversity officer um, is involved within it. Yeah. So we began by. Um, there, it's not the same as the old transect because of the um, the growth and the um, the changes in the way the, the site was being up kept up or kept up. So Nick and I walked and thought, um, really pointed out different paths that seemed to be sensible. Um, as Nick said, this section seven to eight, which goes up on a heap, is absolutely brilliant for all sorts of butterflies during the um, during the the transect year. Um, I don't know what else particular you want me to talk about. Um, loads uh, of gatekeepers, hedge yeah. browns, lots lots of ringlets had. Yeah many ringlets and again that's in that section seven um that's going up to the top of that um yeah. of cops and open grassland up it's there. a mixture isn't it of, of of copses up there it's quite yeah. quite special rather than large areas of grass um which have their own value uh, that's a very mixed habitat and that seems to be, as we were just saying, that edge, edge habitat seems to be a favourite for so many of our butterflies. Mm -hmm. um, even the small heath uh, I see there, you've got in quite good numbers. And that's a, a new threatened, threatened species. Uh, S section seven, section had, the, seven. Yeah. had the highest count. So that's going up the hill um, in, into that hill there. The blues are, are, are represented in moderate numbers, if I remember right. Yes, the the, the common blues are, are represented fairly well. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's some good areas of birdsfoot trefoil, which was actually left over from, uh, it was originally sown with a wildfire mix. And some of that trefoil has managed to survive. A lot of it's just been drowned out by tree growth and scrub. Uh, but it's nice to see the Wakefield um lady really really tuned in and helping the volunteers to improve the quality of their grasslands and they're focused on it and it's nice to see did you feel that um ricky yeah um, very much so and also the amount of volunteers and the people that i that i come across when i'm walking yeah. both volunteers and regular walkers that will engage and are yeah. interested in what they've seen yeah Good. Again, you know, all all the better to try to to involve them. Thank you for your contribution, Ricky. I'm going to move on to my last um, site because we are limited time tonight. Uh, we're just just nine o'clock, so my time is nearly up. Um, Can uh, I just um, quickly plug our um, our training day? So yes. Nick and I are going to be sending out details of a tr of some training we're doing um, on the 15th of April at 7 p.m. So we'll just be looking at um, ID really and the challenging species and how you can tell the difference between them. And yeah, we'll all benefit from Nick's um, skills and experience. So and we'll, um, we'll, we'll build on that uh, feedback that you've given us as well on the whites, yeah. the skippers, uh, the common blue. Um, and use that as a basis to uh, to guide us uh, with the content for the night. But yeah, we'll concentrate on the tricky species, not the easy ones, the tricky ones. Yeah, so invites will be um, sent out shortly. Thank you very much, Kerry, for uh, doing that. And I'll say good night to everyone. Um, bye for now. Thank you. <laughs>